This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast for everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level. You came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of Shanghai, China, co-founder of the Manner Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and dropping it like it's hot. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Manner Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki. Cinospice.com, and he knows what you did last summer. On this episode, John and I discuss the question: If using kids' books to learn Chinese is a good idea, and what about books with pinyin over the Chinese? We'll talk in depth about handwriting characters versus typing characters, plus my commentary on Stephen Colbert's Chinese pronunciation. Later on, we are joined by Vanessa Dewey. Who just up and decided to move to China because she wanted to learn Chinese? Ten years and two kids later, she will talk about her entertaining story of learning the language. All this and more. Let's get to it. One quick note: we discovered after this last episode that John's audio was recorded by the mic on his headphones, as opposed to the professional mic he had. We've fixed this, and all future episodes will be of much better quality. Thanks for bearing with us. Let's do this. All right, Johnny. Jared. Hey, man. How's it going? You go by Jerry, right? Jer- Jared. Jared. Jerry. Every Chinese person, they think Jer- my name Bear. is Jerry. They'll be like, "Hey, Jerry, where's Tom?" Right? Have you heard that one? Tom and Jerry. But Chinese people do like Tom and Jerry. They do. They do. My son in kindergarten, they would show him Tom and Jerry every once in a while. But you know, talking about kids shows like that, it brings up、uh, one of the topics of using kids' books to learn Chinese. And this is a very common thing I'll see people do: is that they're like, "All right, you know, I'm learning Chinese. Let me try to go get some sort of simple books that I can read." So they'll go out to a library or online and they'll look for some kids' books. The thinking is, kids have a low level of Chinese. Therefore, the language that is used in that book will be low level and will be suitable and adequate for me to read. But、um, so, if the books are really low level, it's just like pictures and words. Then that's fine. It's basically flashcards in a book. But as soon as it starts getting to the level of like some kind of story, it gets so hard so fast, and it's like unbelievable and so discouraging. Do you have a kids' book nearby? No, no, I don't either. I should have brought one for this podcast. And and actually, actually, I've done like a survey of books. Like I've gone to bookstores and opened up children's book after children's book, trying to find, you know, a book that isn't trying to cram all kinds of difficult vocabulary into the story. They're just telling a really simple story and simple words because we do that in English, right? A lot of our、uh, kids' books in English they use. Simple vocabulary, but Chinese children's books—I won't say they never do, because some of them do. I, I've found some good ones, but for the most part, they do not cut the kids any slack. Well, actually, I would propose that no, they're not as simple as you would assume. Anyone listening here, if you have any kids' books at home, go grab one of the kids' books, open it up. My kids love Curious George. And I was just reading a book the other night to them, and you know, we have things like toppled down the hill. You know, he scooted. There's a lot of words and verbs and things like that where these aren't normal words for a second language learner to study and to learn. Yeah, you're you're right, you're right. But I'm accounting for that. I'm accounting for that. The Chinese go way over the top. There's also stuff like onomatopoeia, right? Oh, you're saying it's even harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the onomatopoeia yeah, can be crazy. The, the Chinese stuff will will have the same kinds of words, you know, like topple or scoot or whatever the. Chinese versions of that kind of word;、um, those are the easy ones. But then on top of that, they add a bunch of hard, like somewhat literary words, because、uh, I think there's just a sense among Chinese parents where if I'm going to be reading my kid a, a book, why can't they be learning some new vocabulary?、Mm. Whereas、um, for a lot of parents in the states, it's it's not always about vocabulary. A lot of it is just I'm spending time with you. Let's enjoy the story. I also want to cultivate a love of reading, and I think the Chinese parents aren't always thinking along those lines. I think the other aspect too is that when we have children's books, it's usually not the child reading the story; 
it's an adult that's reading the story to the child. And when you have that going on, it's, a, it's much different. So same thing if any of you, anyone out there has any children and you're reading a story to them, can your child actually read what it is that you're reading out loud to them? Right. Typically, if you are reading out loud to the child, they probably can't read it themselves. So you're saying the book is marketed to the reader who's probably the one that bought it. Well, what I'm saying is that the child, even if they do know some characters or if they're even going through first grade or second grade, they can't even read all the characters in the book. A lot of the characters are going to be incomprehensible to them. And they certainly haven't even learned pinyin in kindergarten. So they just don't start learning pinyin until end of first grade. So it's one of these things where the kids' books, they're just not as simple as you would think they would be because they're not written simply. They're written for native speakers who can already understand the language. I mean, I mean, the kids can't read the English, most of the words that you read in English either. So I don't really understand your point. I guess my point is, is that when you have a children's book and it's written in Chinese, the book itself is not going to be writ as simply as you might think it would be. If it was, if it was written simple enough for that child to read it, it would use simple characters and simple words. But the point is, is that the child isn't reading it themselves. The child is listening to an adult read it out loud to them. And so the, the adult can read all those characters. The child can understand it. So they, they, cause, cause they understand the spoken language and they're later on learning the written language. The point is, is that these kids' books are not necessarily written at a low level. Right. It's, it's just like a lot of other language. Adults just kind of talk somewhat normally. Sometimes they dumb down their speech a little bit. We call it motherese. You know, they see, say things like, you want to go poo poo in the potty? Uh, a lot of times, the way that kids learn is just by being exposed to adult speech in the right context. And so, you know, the book provides a context, it has pictures, and then it has relatively adult language. And that's one of the ways that the kids pick up language, right? Because a lot of these books, the, the, the parent will read them to the kid over and over again. So that's going to be one of the places that they learn certain words. And I think for a lot of Chinese parents, those words that they're learning because they read the book over and over again, that's a huge part of the value of, of the book to them. Whereas I, I know for me and for a lot of parents, it's just uh, getting the kid in the habit of reading and wanting to read because uh, loving books is going to have a big impact on their academic future, not just big vocabulary. I think the key point behind this is that kids' books in Chinese are not suitable for people who are learning Chinese as a second language because they're not written for people who are learning Chinese as a second language. So it's pretty much they're not suitable for you because they're not written for you. They're written for native kids. Right. I do think that it would be easier if you were learning English to use English language children's books than it is as a learner of Chinese to use Chinese language children's books. But whatever, that's not really important. Uh, we're learning Chinese here. And the fact is that uh, you might find some useful children's books in Chinese, but it's not going to be easy. And if you're at a low level, it's going to be hard for you to identify those books anyway. Yeah, agreed. And a lot of them have words that if you're not a kid, you really don't need to learn anyway. Yeah, and that's that's the whole thing too, is about the relevancy of the vocabulary that's used in the books. But But one of the issues with these kids' books is, you know, you find a kid's book, you like the topic, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms or something cool, right? You see that it's for kids, you open it up, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can read this. But wait, look, it has pinyin. If it has pinyin, I, I can read it, right? Oh, mercy. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, this, this goes into our... <laughs> I, think, I think we've all fallen for that trap at one point or another if you've ever been to a Chinese bookstore. Oh, yeah. So th this brings up what I call the crippling crutch. That's a pinging over Chinese. So that's when you know you have a book or any article or whatever, and you have all these characters in it. But above the characters, you have the pinging for all of the characters. Now, why is this so bad? Well, because your, your eyes can't help but look at the pinging. Like you need to be reading the characters, but you just keep looking at the pinging. And if you do it that way, you're, you're never going to really learn to read the character. Yes, and for anyone who is a native English speaker, native English, French, Spanish, German, or any other language that uses the Latin alphabet, when you see pinyin over Chinese, you can't not read it. You can't not look at it, right? It's just, Your eyes are naturally drawn to what is familiar to you. 
And and I'm not going to say, okay, you so you can't. But it, to not look at it and to only concentrate on the characters takes significant effort. And it, it can be draining. It's a strain. It is. In fact, a lot of people will physically cover the pinyin, right? Yeah. In fact, I've even seen a series for foreigners where it has pinyin over characters like that, but they have some sort of special, I don't know how to put it, it's like a... a a blind. Like a filter thing? Yeah. I'm describing this terribly, but it's like a, a piece of plastic that has cuts in it that go along with the text. And so what you can do is that you can position it so it'll cover up all the pinging. And if you want to see the pinging, you just shift it up or down and you it'll cover up the characters and you can see the pinging. And I mean, but that's a little bit of a workaround, but it's still, even I'm still not a big fan of that because when you have a system like that, it's so tempting to look at the pinging the second you begin to struggle. One of the things about learning the language is that that's, so there is benefit in that struggle because sometimes you know that character. You look at it like, oh, what is that character? I know I've seen that before. And if you can just sit there for a second or two and, and try to recall that character and then you're like, oh, yes, it's that character. By the time you come across that character again, you're much more likely to recall it quickly. Yeah, you need to struggle a little bit as part of the learning process. You have to have that experience where you worked for it in order for it to really stick. And so, hey, here's an idea. How about not putting the pinyin over or under the characters? That's what I advocate. But some people say, oh, well, if I don't have the pinyin, I can't read it. And to that, I say, well, if you can't read it without the pinyin over the top, then it's probably too hard for you. You probably should try to find something a little easier that's at your level that you can read. Yeah, it's kind of like riding a bike but refusing to take off the training wheels just in case you lose your balance. That's a very apt analogy. You got to take them off. Got to take it off. <laughs> Sometimes you will have some difficulties, but you know, you're know you growing. Well, I also think it's important to understand that why. Why is it this way? Why are there so many Chinese texts with pinging over the top and why do Chinese teachers often use this in the classroom and use this with students? I can draw upon my experience uh, with having my kids in a local school. When they start school in the first grade, and John, you know about this because your kids are in the program in a local school. Yeah, my daughter's in the first grade right now. So in the first semester of first grade, they just start teaching you characters. They don't need, there's no pinging in the book. Towards the end of that first semester, they start introducing some of the pinging sounds. But it's when you get into the second semester that they really start teaching the kids pinging. But by that time, they've really started solidifying their concept of recognizing and learning characters. And so by the time they get into the second semester of the first grade and they start learning pinging, pinging becomes that supplement. It becomes that supplement to learning the language. And the thing that kind of surprised me was that they were starting to read English before they were starting to read pinyin. And then when they do start reading pinyin, they've already started English and they're learning it at the same time. And so by the time they hit second grade, now you start having pinyin above the characters. But by that point, they've had a whole school year of pretty much focusing exclusively on characters. And the pinyin is secondary. So they can read the characters and they can focus on it. And that's what's natural and native to them. So having the pinyin above the characters, it's not really a distraction. It, it actually is a help because if the kids come across a character they don't know, it's like, oh, I know that maybe they even know the meaning of that character. They just forget how to pronounce it when they can just, you know, glance up and bam, there it is. But I think it's interesting to understand uh, the perspective of a native learner. Not every native learner has gone through that exact system, but it's going to be something similar. The, the primary concept is that Chinese characters are primary for them. The pinyin is second. Whereas for us Westerners, pinyin, any English characters are native to us. And that's something that we most easily understand. And Chinese characters become secondary. So when we have that pinyin over the top of the Chinese, it's very difficult for us not to see it. On that same respect, sometimes it's, it's difficult for a Chinese person to understand how we can't just not look at the pinyin. They're like, hey, well, just don't pay attention to the pinyin. Just look at the characters. But it just doesn't work that way for us. Yeah, it's hard to imagine for them maybe how irresistibly drawn to the English letters our eyes are. Actually, you'll see in certain textbooks, websites, there are significant efforts going into this from a design perspective. Like, how can I make this pinyin less attractive to the eye if I want the learner to be reading the characters? 
So for example, in our graded readers, we will use footnotes and put the pinyin at the bottom. So it's not right there next to the characters. Or like on the Chinese grammar wiki, we have the pinyin under the characters, but I try to make it like light. So it's a little bit harder to read so that you're not quite as tempted to, uh, you know, to immediately read it. And then also you can turn it off. You can hide it because it's a website. So um, there's some tricks you can use, but yeah, we definitely advocate learning to read characters because, you know, that's the language. The language is characters without pinyin and pinyin is a helpful addition that is not always there for you and it shouldn't be. That's a great note to end on this topic because pinyin is essential. Like we need that. We totally need pinyin. If we didn't have pinyin, I'm like, gosh, can you imagine trying to learn characters without having some sort of phonetic pronunciation of those? Don't really want to. I don't either. So it's, it's, we need those. It's just that when we rely on it too much, it becomes that crippling crutch. And because that we'll never really learn to walk on our own, just be careful. So I'm not saying that you never look at any or read anything that has pinging over the, over the top of it. I'm just saying as a general rule, try to get materials that you can read at your own level or try to select some sort of materials or there's different resources on, on, on different websites where you can hide that or it's just available there only when you need it. And then one final thing to kind of support this view is that if you're learning Chinese and you're starting to learn characters to communicate, there's a good chance you're going to be using WeChat. There's no opinion over those either. You can, uh, you know, you can copy and paste and look stuff up, but um, that's another area where you're not going to have opinion there. And you really just got to learn to read, and, and you can. Okay, a word from our sponsor is Mandarin Companion. All right. And Mandarin Companion, if you guys don't know already, it's uh, John and I, we started that. We produce easy-to-read novels in Chinese. Our level one books use only 300 basic characters, and they're full-length stories. We have popular titles like Sherlock Holmes, Journey to the Center of the Earth, the Secret Garden, and our newest release was Emma. Actually, no, it was uh, The Ransom of Red Chief. Both great stories. So check them out. You can get them on Amazon or you can check them out on our website, which is mandarincompanion.com. And for all those stories, the pinyin is a safe distance from the characters it corresponds to. That's right. So at the 300 level, we have keywords that we don't expect you to know at that level. And those are highlighted and uh, or have a footnotes with uh, the pinyin and, and definitions but we do not spoon feed you the opinion for the words that you definitely know. No, if you need spoon feeding, go get an IE. That was a bad joke, I know. Okay, John, handwriting versus typing. What are you a fan of? I'm a fan of the typing. Well, me too. All right, done. <laughs> like I, I did have to learn to handwrite to get into grad school because I had to pass the written exam. But after that, you know, my thesis was written in, it was typed in Chinese. And like the most I ever used it was for notes. So I just type all the time now. John, what would you say to a person who, who says, hey, I really want to learn how to write characters, like actually handwrite them? I would say, great, do it. Uh, I, I think there definitely is value for learning to write like the building blocks of characters, the fundamental, you know, component characters, because you never really notice exactly the proportions and how the characters are constructed until you actually have to write them out stroke by stroke. But I am not a fan of writing the characters over and over and just spending tons of time trying to get that into muscle memory. I, I feel like that's a waste of time that could be spent more on more communicative activities. Well, you bring up a, something I really do like is that when you learn to write the characters, it's almost like dissecting a character. It's like an anatomy class. You're dissecting an organism, right? You can see how that character is constructed in the different components. And for me, it helps that character stick in my brain a little bit better. Now you, you have to do that. If you don't like kind of understand the structure of characters, there's no way you're going to be able to internalize thousands of characters, which is your goal, right? That's right. And so it's, you learn all the different radicals and the bushel. Uh, understanding the structure is essential to, to being able to learn the characters. I think the whole writing it by hand was, was one way to do it, and it was just assumed that that was the only way. But nowadays with computers, it's possible to get a really good understanding of all the component parts of characters without having to write them over and over a million times. And I think that's a much better way. 
Yes. So why we are talking, hey, I think, you know, there's there's some good things about learning to write characters. I don't think it should be the real focus. And I have met some people say, well, I'm not even going to learn characters because I it's just too hard to write them and stuff. And I'm like, well, hey, you know, first off, learning to read is, is really important. But nowadays, you don't even have to really handwrite characters. Typing is where it's at. Yeah, and typing in Chinese, of course, is using pinyin and then identifying the character that corresponds to it. So it's kind of like spelling it out how it sounds and then just being like, yeah, that's the character. It's not that bad. Honestly, one of the ways I really started learning a lot more characters is when I started typing in Chinese. In the old days, I was using QQ, which was a computer-based chat program, predecessor of WeChat for anyone who's using WeChat. I would type in characters to communicate with different people in my office because I worked in a market research company and there was about 100 people and only three people really spoke good English. And so we were speaking uh, Chinese a lot. I would type in the character, I pop the characters. I'm like, uh, I guess that's it. I'm going to assume that's the right characters and I'd pop it in. And then usually it was. And that was, that helped me learn a lot of characters. Yeah, usually it works. Not always. But you were also learning from your mistakes a lot, weren't you? Yeah, I was. And that's true. You, you just try something and you make mistakes, but you kind of learn from that. But learning to type has been invaluable. Yeah, so once you can read, you can start typing. There's really no reason to wait. Get something like WeChat or some other kind of chat program and you can start typing in Chinese. Uh, the great thing about computers nowadays, which was not that way like 10, 20 years ago when some of us started learning Chinese, is that every major operating system supports Chinese. So it's pretty easy to just turn it on, you know, pinion input, start typing. Like, just try it. Yeah, typing is invaluable. And nowadays, handwriting... And I think I mentioned this in one of our past episodes. It's just I, I've, the only times I really handwrite is if I'm filling in some sort of government form and or writing down my address, and that's about it. Yeah, actually, I handwrite sometimes when I have to help my daughter a little bit with her Chinese homework. Even though I don't talk to her in Chinese, my wife sometimes enlists me because she's tired of writing out Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, will, I will put this out, though, is that if you have kids that are in Chinese dual immersion programs, you know, typically they're going to be learn how to handwrite. And that's understandable because you're in a like a long term educational setting and the kids need to learn how to write and they're writing essays and they're writing letters and they're, they're doing all sorts of things. And so I think that's a good case of an example where in America where someone, hey, really need to learn how to handwrite. And that's the way it is now, but I don't think it's going to always be like that. Um, educational institutions take a long time to change. And so there's a lot of handwriting now in 20 years, 50 years, maybe not. Um, so, you know, we're, we're starting this transition now. You can type. You can. That's something even happens in China. Is there's that concept of character amnesia. You have native Chinese people that are spending their time in professional office environments and they're typing all the time, but they're not handwriting. And when they go back to handwriting, they're kind of like, uh, I forget how to write this character, which is totally normal, right? And some people say, well, how can I like not remember how to write this character? I'm like, well, it's, it's kind of like how you can remember how to read a certain word in English, but you maybe have a hard time spelling it. Yeah, I have pretty severe character amnesia. I used to be able to write so many characters without a without, you know, even half a second of thought to write it out. But nowadays it's a it's much slower than that. Um but the thing is, I don't really need to handwrite and I know that if I for some reason need to start writing a lot, I can bring it back. But for now, you know, for the past 12 years or whatever, I I just don't need to. So, uh, I'm just not going to invest all that time for something I don't need. Same thing for me. I, I spent uh, hundreds of hours practicing characters with my kids who were in local schools, but I now I can only write, I don't even know. I thought like maybe a year or two, I could write four or 500 offhand. Now it's probably 300. I don't know. And that's after hundreds of hours of practice. It's, you, it takes a lot of work to keep that up, to really learn how to write characters and keep it up. But if you do want to, you know, Go for it. it. It's great. And there's some great resources out there. In fact, one I do recommend is Scritter. Scritter has a great app out there for learning how to handwrite characters. Yeah, and the argument there is if you can remember how to write a character, then you're never going to forget how to read it. And you, you can't really argue with that. That's true. I, I would agree with that. The other thing is some people uh, like Chinese calligraphy. It is an art form. If you're one of those people, then obviously you're going to have to learn to write a lot of characters. And you're going to like it. So that's cool, too. 
All right, let's go on to rants and raves. I have got a rant for you, John. Oh, boy. Lay it on me. All right. So here it is. Okay, it is from Stephen Colbert. Uh, Stephen Colbert, he's a, the Tonight Show. It's how he pronounces Xi Jinping. Okay, and if you guys don't know, Xi Jinping, he is the president of China, and he pronounces it Xi Jinping. If I'm not mistaken, and I don't think I am, uh, somebody has a bit of a man crush on Xi Jinping. Of course, of course, they have good chemistry. They met on Xi Harmony. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh. it kind of grinds my gears because, you know, okay, XI, a lot of times foreigners will encounter that. They don't know how to pronounce it. But, and the X sound is not an SH sound, but you could just say Xi, like he, she, Xi Jinping, you know, that would sound a lot better than an Xi Jinping. Come on, he's on like broadcast TV. I'm sure there's somebody or, you know, might be able to help him with the pronunciation on that. So uh, if anyone out there can help uh, Stephen Colbert figure out how to pronounce Xi Jinping better, uh, please do what you can. Yeah, actually, I've heard uh, a similar version of the same rant, which is the word Beijing. People say Beijing, right? They take the J and they make it a Z. I'm not quite sure how that got started, but the Chinese J is not the same as the English J, but it doesn't sound like a Z. And so if you take the Chinese J, you make it a Z. You take the Chinese X, you make it a Z. Then you're making everything a Z, and it just sounds weird. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Beijing. Xi Jinping. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. Okay, so I have a rave. All right, let's hear it, John. Okay, it's also related to technology because um, there's lots of reasons to celebrate technology as it relates to learning Chinese. So um, I'm going to talk about how this works on my iPhone, but you guys with Android phones, you can do the same thing. I'm just not sure exactly what the the names for the features are. But like on an iPhone, if you go into uh, settings, general accessibility, there's this thing called speech, and then you can speak selection. And then when you go into your Chinese websites, Chinese text, you can select the text and then get the little menu to pop up and you can have it speak the Chinese. And uh, that can be really useful. Like maybe I want to read this article, but I need to do something else that I need to look at. I can, you know, select the whole page and then choose speak selection and I can just listen to it. I think that's really cool. Well, that's great. So it's kind of like create uh, audio for something you're reading. You could read along with it too, right? Yeah, text to speech. And I'm I'm not talking about like an ebook reader that has that built in. It's system wide, so any text. You could even go into the little the little notes app, type out any Chinese sentence and then have it read it aloud. Oh, that could be really valuable. So that could help you along with you know reading, you can listen to the pronunciation while you're reading it. Actually, why don't I do that right now? Let me see if this will record. Ooh. All right, we're going to get a live demonstration, folks. Stand by. So I'm typing in the notes app, and then I'm long pressing select all, and then I have to hit the little side arrow to go to the third screen, and then there's a speak, and then I can hit speak. Wow. John, is that true? Are you, are you really American? <laughs> I am American. I mean, you've been in China 18 years. I, I wonder if you switched nationalities. I just wasn't sure. Just, just confirming. I'm impressed. That's definitely deserving of a rave. So, hey, guys, anyone who's got a, an Apple phone, Apple device, you should be able to do that. Now you can do it too on your Android phone. All right. Well, I don't think I have it enabled yet. Yeah. It, it's been a feature for a while, and the voices that read the text are getting better and better. But a lot of people, like, they don't really look at that feature but it's actually getting quite good. Wow, that's really cool. I think that's a definitely a good resource. I wasn't aware of that, so I'm glad you were able to share that with us. Jared, that is your homework. I want you to find that feature on your phone, figure out how to use it, and then report back to us on how it goes. Yes, sir, Johnny, sir. I'll make sure I get that done right away. Okay, I'm Vanessa. <laughs> I met Vanessa Dewey back when I first moved to China in 2010. Um, I'm from Los Angeles. I have my family here. I have two kids, and we're just living the Shanghai dream. Vanessa is also a test reader for Manor Companion. Look in the credits of most of our books, and you'll find her name. You're married, too. Yeah. <laughs> Did I not mention that? No. <laughs> 
I have a husband. <laughs> He's great. The reasons for learning Chinese can be so different. And here's a story you won't want to miss. Stay tuned. He has a mighty name, doesn't he? <laughs> His name is Ramsey. Ramsey Dewey, yes. yes. <laughs> and he came here um, kind of as the trailing spouse because I wanted to learn Chinese. And uh, he decided to do what he loves, what he, which he was doing before. He's uh, doing mixed martial arts. He's a, a coach. And he, was, he started off a few years doing uh, cage fighting, but he has retired from that. <laughs> He's quite the YouTube celebrity as well. <laughs> yes, he has a, a channel, Ramsey Dewey. Check it out. <laughs> There's my plug. <laughs> there you go. Check it out, guys. And he doesn't speak Chinese. Um, well, he, actually, his Chinese is getting much better. Oh, is it? He does have long hours of trainings. He doesn't get a lot of opportunity to learn Chinese, but he it has improved a lot in the last 10 years. <laughs> Tell me about your experience. Like, why did you start learning Chinese? Okay, well, when I was in the U.S., I was working at a driving school. I was an instructor there, and we were close to a university. A lot of my clients were Chinese. I had discovered that quite a few of them didn't actually speak English, and I had a difficult time communicating with them. I didn't really know what to do, and I talked to a few people, and I was like, what do I do when they don't understand me? And and everything. And I didn't really get any good, you know, conclusion to that. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to learn Chinese. <laughs> so Because your students <laughs> couldn't speak English very well. Yes. And it was a matter of just, you know, making sure they don't hit another car, you know, go on, the, <laughs> on the wrong side of the road. So, I mean, some things when you're teaching, when you're, you know, teaching driving, you don't necessarily need, you know, to say anything. You kind of tell them like um, with your hands or motion, but sometimes you really need to use, you know, words. So... Uh, my first experience learning Chinese was, uh, you know, turn left, turn right, and <laughs> stop. <laughs> and so you're pretty good in a taxi in China, aren't you? <laughs> that was like my basis of Chinese for a long time. I think I knew how to say, like, stop before hello. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Break. <laughs> so <laughs> my first Chinese tutor, I guess, was um, one of my clients. And I met with her once a week, and um, she gave me lessons, and... And then I, I made a lot of friendships um, because I guess I started to become like a little local celebrity among all the Chinese because they were like, oh, she can speak Chinese. She understands us. So they, then I started getting more Chinese driving students. Really? <laughs> yes. And they all started like, oh, go to that instructor. Anyway, one of the uh, students was like, hey, did you ever think of coming to like China? That would be kind of cool. I could maybe hook you up with a job or something because he was working at a university before. So I was like, oh, huh, China. Okay, well, you know, that'd be kind of cool. At that point, I had learned Chinese for about a year with my tutor, and my Chinese was getting pretty good. It wasn't just the driving lingo anymore. So you were uh, had a level of conversational yeah, Chinese? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point, about a year. Like, it was only like the driving lingo for about, you know, two or three months. But then after that, I started developing actual other words, vocabulary. So, um, yeah, so about that point, I was thinking, you know, I don't really like the long hours of the driving school and it would be kind of nice to have an adventure. And I also, you know, didn't have kids at that time. And so I was like, hey, Ramsey, <laughs> would you like to come to China? We could go teach English for a year. How did that conversation go between you two? Well, at that time, Ramsey, he had opened up his own little gym behind our house. I wouldn't say it wasn't very successful, but it wasn't making too much money at the time. And he's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> so, okay. Wow. So, so he was on board. He was on board. And plus we both thought it would just be a year and just be an adventure and I could improve my Chinese like in a real native Chinese setting. And uh, so we decided to go. And Now for all the listeners, this was <laughs> 10 years ago, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and we're still here. <laughs> it sucks you in. <laughs> Be careful, everyone. A lot of people don't realize that Shanghai is like such an amazing city. I Well, I mean, I guess they don't realize China has so many amazing modern cities. If I was out in the boondocks, maybe yeah, I would have probably lasted a year. But like Shanghai's like the New York of China and you never get bored. There's just so much to do. Your life is fun when you live here. <laughs> so you up and moved to China. Yeah. Did you have a job when you before you came over? Yeah, yeah. So my student driver person, he uh, they uh, secured a job for us. It was really cool because the university like had us had a free apartment for us, 
which I wasn't used to that kind of lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a very big one, but it wasn't a, a free apartment. Okay. So you moved to China yep. at this stage. Uh, you've been studying Chinese for a year? Yeah. Was it a year and a half? Uh, about a, yeah, a little over a year. So you up and moved. Mm -hmm. I guess you'd probably put everything in storage or sold it off. Yeah, we had a huge yard sale. <laughs> <laughs> Came to China. What then? Yeah, we taught at this university for about two years. I think the within if, probably six months, I ended up signing up for night classes to learn Chinese at Donghua University. Actually, I think I did a summer program first. It was like a, an intense summer program. And then for the following two semesters, I did um, night classes. And that was very intense because their university classes had a whole different style that I was used to. It was like, you're like writing essays in Chinese. And that was really intense. So I think by the second semester of that, I kind of got burned out. And really by at that level, because I was like at level four, and that, not a lot of, I would say, Westerners were at that level. Cause level was, four? Well, I don't know how to equate that to anything, but oh, okay. in, in the university, it was level four. Oh, university level four. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. HSK four? Or I what? know. Okay. I can't tell you. Some arbitrary <laughs> leveling system. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it, I by then, all the Westerners kind of dropped out because it's too intense. And all like, if there were, you know, the foreigners that were learning it, we were all like Korean or Japanese. And their, you know, Hansa was... Their characters were amazing because it's similar to their writing style. So I was like, oh, I'm like drowning. it." By that level, I was kind of like, I'm more interested in maybe the oral aspects of the language and actually the reading. Like that program really helped with my reading. And I'm really grateful for that. At some point, I was like, I'm just happy typing on the computer Chinese. Like I don't want to memorize all of these strokes and stuff. Yeah. It takes a lot of work to... <laughs> and my retention wasn't very good. Like, at one point, I could write, like, a 150-character essay without looking at a dictionary. And then, uh, yeah, by then, I was just, like, a little burned out. The novelty wears off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it does. It does. It really does. At first, you're so excited. You buy all... You purchase all these materials, and you're like, I'm ready for this. And then, yeah, after a while, it's... Oh, that's a big commitment because it's not just learning the characters, but retaining the characters. Well, then yeah. retaining the hand, like how to fluently yeah. write them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of learners may, uh, they encounter once they yeah. get into it, right? It, it, it was one thing to read a character. Yeah. It's another thing to be yeah. able to write the character. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm inspiring any, inspiring anybody right now. <laughs> uh, I usually recommend people like don't bother trying to learn how to write okay, characters. Okay, good. Okay, you know? we're, I'm on board. <laughs> Re exactly. Typing is fantastic. Yeah, I type every day in Chinese all the yeah. time. Like in in different you know facilities, I'm always writing in Chinese. So yeah, for that, definitely learn how to write. But if you want to do it on the computer. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think the only time when I'm in China, yeah. like where I really handwrite something is maybe I write my address for somebody yeah. or I'm filling out a government form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, typing does just fine. Yeah, it's great. I love yeah. it. So when you came here, then you encountered a very different educational style and educational yeah. system, right? How was that different than from what you're used to or what you would expect or what you had encountered before? It's just, you know, very lecture based and then just a lot of reading and writing, a lot of intense reading and writing and answering questions. I I didn't feel like there was a lot of role playing or anything. It, it was, I don't know, I, I didn't, f normally when you learn like a language class, it's a lot more exciting, I think more fun. <laughs> but this was just, yeah, really hardcore university style. And um, I think... I wasn't, I don't know. I was kind of over being a student. I had already paid my dues in the university. <laughs> I thought this night class would be different, but it's it was very much a very intense university course. So at the same time, I didn't feel like I really fit in anywhere because if I did some like other Chinese classes focused on bringing foreigners in, it was too easy for my level. So I was kind of in limbo. I was like, it was either too hard or too easy. And I didn't really know where I fit. <laughs> so. After that, I just kind of started to give up on the lessons and just thought maybe I'll get a private tutor. So if you had a, someone came to you and asked for some advice about if they're trying to make a decision to go to a Chinese university to study Chinese, what would what advice would you give to that person? Yeah, I just kind of wanted to first ask them like what their goals were. If they really wanted that intense course, then that would actually be a good option for them because a lot of people want to take the HSK I never made that really my goal. I think 
like I never I needed it for a, a job. <laughs> I mean, Chinese was always something that was fun for me. If I started studying it, I would then I think not have so much fun learning the language. So. So you uh, went through the university pr uh, program for yeah. uh, how long was that? A semester, two semesters? Uh, it was about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. And and how do you think that helped your Chinese? Well, yeah, it it really sealed the deal in my literacy for sure. I think that was where I could actually start really reading f fluently texts and stuff. If I didn't have that course, I would be very difficult. And at that time, I didn't have your amazing um, Chinese readers, that would have been a really great option. And that was something that I was looking for and never could find. And that was really frustrating. And even the text that they gave me at the university was very challenging. There's just too many words. And so it was really stressful in that respect. Side but. note for the listeners, uh, Vanessa <laughs> is one of our test readers for Mandarin Companion. <laughs> so actually, this is very interesting. So talk mm -hmm. about your experience with learning to read mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, how that affected your Chinese and even what you experienced in the college mm -hmm. system versus what you wish you would have had, yeah. I guess, in comparison. So what I really wanted is I wanted that satisfaction of being able to read a text and feel like I understood it and didn't just, you know, drown in non-understanding I felt really frustrated because it's not like you could just pick up a newspaper. A newspaper was just like so complicated. I would go to like the foreign language bookstore and I would look for some easy readers there. But it was also very challenging. And I think there was just even like children's books would have all these new vocabulary words. You would think that children's books would be a good place to start, but it's not. No, it's it's not. <laughs> and even now with my, you know, higher Chinese level, I still encounter words in Chinese yeah. children's book where I'm like, what is that character? Um, it's, I tell those people all the time, you know, that children's books are not good for us second language learners because yeah. they're not written for us. You know, yeah. like I, I pulled the hung, very hungry caterpillar once yeah. and I did a little analysis on it, you know, the Chinese version, you know, when you have automatopoeia characters yeah, and then yeah, you yeah, have exactly. like, and he drilled out of the cocoon and pop, there he was, you know, yeah. and then you have, I don't even remember the Chinese characters, but you know, yeah. these are characters, they're not even on the HSK level, you yeah. know? Yeah, exactly. So there wasn't a lot of options and uh, it was very frustrating and I wished I would have had some of those resources that later on you introduced me to because that would have really helped a lot. I just want to talk about my personal experience reading this those series. Like I said, I was always trying to find a book where I can feel like that sense of accomplishment reading um, the story and feeling like, wow, I really am not having to look in the dictionary every five seconds. And if you've ever looked at other literacy texts, it's that's kind of a common thing. Like you, it ruins the flow of reading and the pleasure of reading when you have to stop and look a, up a word. And sometimes you don't have to and you, you can kind of get it by context. But sometimes you really just don't understand the whole meaning of the sentence because of a few vocabulary words. So what I love about that series is just, you know, you can read through it and you don't have to stop you know, and of course, there's a few words that are a little challenging and you may not know, but you can figure it out through context or you can use like the little dictionary in it. But it's just a brilliant series. I just so surprised no one's ever done it before. You know, why has no one ever come up with this <laughs> idea? I mean, I've seen attempts and they didn't they didn't work out very well. <laughs> but, you found um, but you find attempts at those when you were, you I, were yes, I found some. Well, no, no, I found the attempts after the interview. I never found anything quite like you know, the Mandarin Companion series. That's the only ones I found that I actually feel it's just really, you know, intelligently designed and really understands the foreign, I should say foreign, I'm in China, so I'm thinking foreign, is the first series that I really feel like, you know, the development of it really thought about the Chinese learner perspective. And a lot of times when a series is created by maybe a Chinese company, they're just not quite sure how outside China person learns their language. I mean, sometimes I feel that they probably need an outside foreign person's perspective, but I don't know if they ever have access to people to do that. And so they they just don't quite get it, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, it can be a difficult thing. You know, it's yeah. it, it's it's hard to understand a learner's perspective yeah. if you're not a learner. Yeah, and that's what's cool about your your uh, company is because both of you had that experience and now you're at the level of Chinese that you were able to develop that series successfully. 
Well, we appreciate yeah. you being one of our test readers. Yeah, it was so much fun. Every time you 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 know asked, I was like, oh, yes, give me another one. It's so <laughs> exciting. So, okay, so you learned mainly literacy. That was the main thing. That's one kind of frustrations that I had for the university course because I felt like it was 95% focused on literacy. I didn't feel like there was that much conversation being built there. So I thought, oh. So it was kind of heavy on one aspect but maybe missing a different aspect. Yeah, exactly. How important do you think literacy is to your experience in learning Chinese and uh, maybe even living in China? Literacy is so essential because first of all, I'm kind of a, I don't know, I like to, I really do like to read signs and kind of know where I'm going. I don't like to feel helpless in a city, Mm -hmm. you know, and there isn't pinyin very much available except for like on the street signs and stuff. So I really feel like a sense of satisfaction just being able to know where I'm going and reading things and even just shopping like on Taobao, the fact that I can really fully understand the purchases that I'm buying and I don't have to use like a translator and that I can talk to the sellers as well and send them messages and things like that. It's just, it makes me feel like I'm at home here. And um, I definitely think that's one of the reasons I've been here so long is because I've just felt at home because I don't feel restricted. I kind of had a similar experience mm-hmm. when I started learning to read Chinese. It, to me, it felt like the the streets came alive because before I couldn't read the, the signs on the shops. Mm-hmm. And so you, you don't know what it is and it just, you know, fades into the background. But all of a sudden you start seeing, oh, wait, that's that's a hair salon. Oh, oh, oh this guy's like a shoe repairer, yeah, you know, and, exactly. <laughs> and all of a sudden the, 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 everything comes alive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So reading, very important to you, I guess. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And I also just enjoy reading like actually like books now, which I never thought I could do before. And I didn't have the patience. But now I've actually picked up books and I'll I'll read books. So. Oh, uh, authentic Chinese books. Well, <laughs> no, that's okay. What, what are you doing? Tell me, tell us. They're kind of like elementary school, middle school levels. That's okay. That's great. That's a huge win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'll like sometimes when I'm like at a store or a bookstore and I see something like, oh, the journey. I don't actually even know what the, the name of the story is. The journey of the monkey king. <laughs> oh, the uh, journey to the West. Journey to the West. <laughs> of course. Yeah, I know that. The, the journey to the West. Yeah. You know, I'll, try and I'll, I'll read like a simplified, like children's type of version, maybe like fifth grade level of that. And, that, and, that, and that's fun for me. And it really builds up like my literacy as well. Through your experience in learning Chinese, mm. can you think about what were some of the most difficult times that you had or the biggest challenges? Mm, yeah, I, I think my biggest challenge was when I first came here, I felt like I could speak very well. At least at that time, I thought I did. And, I, and, as, and, you know, I was used to hearing my private Chinese tutor speak to me or listening to, you know, CDs. And I feel like, oh, OK, I understand everybody. And when I got here and then you get in a taxi and like they start talking to you, I was like, what language is this? This is not the language <laughs> that I learned. I was so confused. Yeah. When people would tell me things, I would just be like. I don't know what they're saying. Even just like buying something from the store, they'd be like, Sisaqua. And I'm like, is that 14 or is that 40? <laughs> like, I don't know what Sisaqua is. Sisaqua, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> four, four or four, 40? So I, know I was just like, yeah, for the first while, I was really, really frustrated. And I just was like, oh, this is so hard. Surprisingly, now I feel like my listening is so much better than my speaking. Can you think about any breakthrough moments that you had while learning Chinese where all of a sudden maybe something really clicked or you had an experience that really motivated you as you went along? Um, When I stopped thinking about the tones in terms of one, two, three, four, (laughs) because when I first started learning Chinese, I I felt restricted by that. Like this is the first tone, the second tone, third tone, fourth tone. And I guess that's a really good way to learn when you first start. But and it would be funny because I, when somebody would say a word and I would ask them, well, what tone it is? Even Chinese people would be like, uh, like they wouldn't even really sometimes be familiar or they'd have to think about it for a little bit, you know? And then one day it just clicked as like, stop thinking about one, two, three, four, like what's, <laughs> and just listen to how it sounds. When I started mimicking how the language sounds, I just, I stopped thinking about tones and my tones just were natural after that. Oh, really? Yeah. 
it's so much easier now after I gave that up. So maybe it's just going for the the feel of it. Yeah, or? you just go. The, I mean, it's a tonal language. Obviously, there's like mu- is, there's a musicality to it. You just go with the music of it. Once you hear the words often enough, then you just know how it sounds, and you don't have to think about what tone it is. Well, that's how kids and learn it in exactly, China. Right? Exactly. I guess I'm just being like a little Chinese kid going through the system. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Works for you. Yeah. <laughs> so how do people react when your kids speak Chinese? They go crazy because, first of all, you know, you probably know because your kids are rather blonde as well. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the lighter their hair is, the more they go crazy if they're speaking Chinese. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and um, they are just so excited. And they barely have to say anything. And they're just like, you speak Chinese so well. And they're so excited. And they're just so happy and positive and friendly. They just love it. And uh, Shanghai, not so much. But when we travel outside of Shanghai... One time we went to Hello Kitty Land and like... Where's that at? <laughs> I didn't know that was a real place. <laughs> Hello Kitty Land is in Anji. Uh-huh. Um, and so, yeah, it's it was really weird because we went there and we were like celebrities. It was the first time I felt like I was like a famous person and everyone wanted to take our picture and talk to our kids. And when they find out they speak Chinese, they just go crazy and they just love it. Well, you are at Hello Kitty Land. You know what type of people that attracts? (laughs) That's true. (laughs) (laughs) I got to say, I'm not too surprised, but uh, that sounds like a fun experience. Yeah. So what is your Chinese superpower? My Chinese superpower, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know if I have a Chinese superpower. My Chinese superpower is somehow able, me being able to get through Eve's Chinese homework. <laughs> because, yeah, sometimes it's pretty intense, especially for a first grader. <laughs> yes. And she's in the native Chinese speaker class, which I kind of had to push for. Because as soon as they saw she's a foreigner, they're like, well, we want her to put her in the learning Chinese as a foreigner class. And I said, no, she's been in her whole life. I want her to be in the Chinese native speaker class. So I pushed for that. And they're like, well, we don't know if you can support that. I said, I can support that. Plus I'll have a tutor. So my tutor comes three days a week. And um, so she does it then. But the other days I do it and usually it takes us about two hours to get through all of it. It's pretty intense. <laughs> I helped my son Miles up to fourth grade wow. <laughs> in local so, school. So you know. <laughs> yeah, well, we actually got tutors, I think, by the time third grade rolled around. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a challenge. Yeah. But but that's great. She's having that opportunity. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I've seen, I've seen my friends put their kids in international schools in Shanghai and their children's ability to speak Chinese is very low because English just dominates the classroom. So I was worried about that. So I didn't, I wanted to prevent that from happening. If you could go back and do anything different along your journey of learning Chinese, what would it be? I guess I would have liked to have done Chinese for my minor in college. I did Russian, and now I don't use that at all. <laughs> so, but who, who knew that I needed it in my yeah. life? You know, Chinese is just, I know this sounds weird to some people, but I think it's such a beautiful language, especially Mandarin. I feel it's just, I don't know, I just love the way it sounds. And I don't know. It's it's just one of my passions. I think learning and speaking. And when I go back to the U.S. um, just for vacations, I miss it. Even I'm just like there for two weeks. I miss speaking Chinese. And I'm like, I need to speak this language. I need to speak it to someone. (laughs) You know. And sometimes I'll find like Chinese people like in the grocery store. And of course, I wait till I hear them speaking because you never want to make assumptions. (laughs) And so when they start talking, then I might come up with. (laughs) Something to tell them, or just need them. Oh, need a hide the cry. You know, <laughs> I mean, just anything, anything that I could tell them, so that yeah, because it's weird. I don't know. I think if I went back to the states, I would have such a hard time. I've already told myself that I would live like in a very heavily Chinese city. You know, like <laughs> where it's the, most of the population is Chinese. Because I like I couldn't not speak Chinese every day. What advice would you give to someone who's learning Chinese now? I guess the thing is a lot of people feel Chinese is very difficult. Um, And I want to tell you that Chinese is extremely easy. If you can get over like the tonal aspect of it, the grammar is especially so simple. And I love it because I learned Russian, which is just the grammar is just very difficult (laughs) if you know Mm -hmm. anything about Russian. And Chinese compared to that and just compared to even Spanish. My husband always tells me, oh, Spanish is so much easier. And I'm like, actually, I feel Chinese is. I know that's weird to say, but I really don't like, you know, all those 
yeah, things have gender and you have to remember which one and, you know, and just conjugating verbs. I just love that I don't have to do that in Chinese. <laughs> and so I was one of those people that like, okay, give me tonal language. That's fine because I'm also a musical person and I'm sure I can handle that. But when you give me like complex grammar or oh, throwing the verb at the end of the sentence like they do in Japanese or Korean or whatever, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So I love Chinese because it's just the most simple grammar ever and <laughs> that I can I can handle that. And so I would say my advice would be is if you're ever feeling very frustrated and you just feel like oh Chinese is so difficult just remember once you get past the tones like that part because that's usually kind of a block for people or just like in literacy in general learning the characters then it's smooth sailing from there because yeah conversation the everything like the, anything that involves like the especially the oral language it's just like it comes so easily and just flows after that after you've gotten over those two hurdles do you have a favorite mandarin companion book i think my favorite is the ransom of the red chief be just just because i'm kind of i like humor in the story and i just felt like that one that really one really really engaged me i mean they all engage me obviously but i like I just related to the humor more to it, and it just made me laugh. So, <laughs> Side note on that book, we based the illustrations of the little boy off my son, Colin. Uh, <laughs> that is good to know. I'll have to look at it again. That's yeah, funny. Somewhat looks like him. Not, not totally, but just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Vanessa, thanks so much. It's it's so great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for letting me come. And it was fun talking about my experience. And I hope that some, you know, learners of Chinese can relate to my experience or feel inspired by it and keep on with their journey of learning Chinese. You can learn Chinese. You can definitely learn Chinese. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, distant relatives, your Uber driver, bounty hunter, chemist, postman, railroad conductor, and that one guy named Ed. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at MandarinCompanion.com. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner. I'd like to thank Vanessa Dewey and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pazin. See you next time.